My name is Michelle Jackson. I'm a web strategist at Palantir, and I am here with Allison Manley, who is a sales and marketing manager. And today we're not going to talk a whole lot about what we do um, in regards to our work at Palantir, but we are going to talk about a really cool initiative that we started last year. So last year there was a lot of bustle about inclusion and diversity and what does the community mean, what does it look like, who is really part of the community and, and how do we define that. I've spent a lot of my life talking, defining, explaining and discussing diversity and at this stage in my career, having worked in youth education, I just wanted to get to work. I didn't really want to talk a little bit about you know, how are we going to communicate with people to make them feel included? What words are we gonna say to make them safe? I spent a lot of my life talking about those things and I was a little bit more interested in you know, the action part of, of what it means to include people. So I partnered with Allison, who also likes to get to work. And so essentially, uh, today we're just going to give you an overview of the history of the initiative uh, you know what we're doing this year, uh, our process for um, implementing something like this, uh, you know what worked well, what didn't work well, how do we even begin to measure uh, what success looks like, what's next, and then definitely how you can get involved as well and implement something like this uh, with your agency or even in your community. So Allison is going to take us back to the history of this year's initiative. Um, hi. So. Um I, uh, I, the one thing I do want to say about Palantir, um, not necessarily about our processors or anything, but one of the things I'm particularly excited about at Palantir is that we are a very diverse group. We're more than 50% women. Um, mo many of those women are in leadership roles. Um, we have a fair number of minorities that also work at our place, and I think that's a wonderful thing. And so in our own little tiny Palantir bubble, we're very diverse, which is um, very great as our own little marker, but of course we know that the tech industry, and bless you, the tech industry as a whole is not very diverse, so we were looking for ways to try to expand this out um, elsewhere. So last year, um, you may recall, if you were here last year, that Chris Rooney did give a talk um, in one of these rooms here at DePaul just about how do we make the tech industry more diverse, and I am fortunate enough to be in a position where, since I'm the sales and marketing manager, I have a budget that I am in control of, and I'm also not billable. So I have time to do with what I want. <laughs> so um, I went up to him afterwards and I said, you know, Chris, it's only three weeks until DrupalCon, but I had a crazy idea. How hard would it be if we could just sponsor some students in Baltimore to come join us at DrupalCon for a day, you know, that's probably all we can pull off in three weeks, but how can we just sponsor some students to come for a day and we can just show them what Drupal looks like? And um, that, he said, yeah, you know, that sounds great. And I said, you know, I've got the time and the budget to make some stuff happen. I'm sure we can get some things donated like DrupalCon tickets and, um, uh, and, and passes of, of all sorts. So um, we teamed up and Michelle, conveniently at the time, was not resourced very heavily. She also happens to be based in Baltimore. So there, were, there was a lot of serendipity there where we just had two of us with some time on our hands and money um, and the uh, tenacity to get some stuff done. We um, did start initially looking at some organizations for high school students, right? Girls Who Code, things like that, that had local chapters. You know, when we talked about how are we going to find these students, what do we do? Um, we very quickly realized high school students was probably a terrible idea because um, with that little notice, they'd have to miss school. And then there's absenteeism problems with, you know, their grades and their report cards and spring break didn't align and, and all those things. So we said, you know what, maybe we need to look more at the 18 to 24 crowd and, and up. Um, so moving ahead, we... Um, we did manage with um, partnering with NPower, who is an organization that Michelle found that um, had a Baltimore chapter. They have chapters nationwide to get five students to come. We very quickly cobbled together with the help of the DA lending us this room and Ryan Price on our team and Chris Rooney uh, a day of training. Um, it was basically training on the basics of Drupal in the morning and then they had the afternoon free to themselves to um, meet with some people 
for lunch within the greater community. We did this ad hoc lunch where we asked other people at Lull about Media Current, you know, other firms, you know, who wants to come and sit and have lunch with these guys and just tell them about Drupal and, and all the ways that you got into Drupal? Because, of course, nobody goes to college to get a career in Drupal, right? That's not a thing. So everyone comes at it from such different avenues. So we, we had a huge turnout. We, um, we had more people interested in talking to the students than students, um, which was fantastic. So um, we were able to pull this off with just three weeks and um, get a day of these um, lovely gentlemen just learning about Drupal. Um, so then we thought, okay, once that was over, how do we actually, now that we have a year to plan, <laughs> how can we make this a little more organized and better? And... Um, so I'll let Michelle take it from here, but that's where we are now. Right, so we came out of the con really wanting to answer two questions. One, what is this gonna look like moving forward? But two, how we're gonna resource this? You know, I don't have the luxury of always being available to do these types of you know, activities. And so a big question we have that I'll talk about later is actually capacity issue. How do you address that? How do you actually resource it? We already got into the capacity issue when we were first trying to figure out who, what kind of students you were going to uh, you know, recruit. And one way we addressed this by was by partnering with existing nonprofits who had already pre-vetted these students. So we didn't have to actually go through and do an extensive vetting process or having to go out and find and recruit students. So having a pre-vetted pool of students who were already exposed to a lot of those principal tech concepts was really important. But in 2018, we were wondering, okay, what are we gonna do next? Is this something we wanna keep to Baltimore? This isn't really something that, you know, is, is limited to Baltimore just because of the vast opportunities available to partner with the chapters all across the country, um, specifically with, with NPower. Um, in 2018, we did uh, end up partnering with uh, Genesis Works, uh, which is based here in Chicago, but like NPower, has other chapters throughout the US. And because the Drupal community is so vast, we found that this type of partnership was key uh, just because this would allow us to actually uh, scale the initiative that we had started in 2017. And you'll notice Nashville's not on the list. So this was something that we actually discussed was, well, do we stick with the organization NPower that we started with knowing that they don't have a Nashville chapter and we have to fly people to Nashville, or do we try to, every single year, as DrupalCon moves, try to find a different organization in each city, partner with them and do it that way, and not worry about travel costs? So that was something we had to make a decision, and in the end, we decided, you know what, Palantir is based here in Chicago, we've got people on the ground here, um, NPower really worked out well with us, partnering with us, so since they had enough locations, we figured we'll just absorb travel costs, and we'll do it that way. Also, partnering with an in, with an organization that was based in Nashville that perhaps doesn't have the um, that breadth, that regional um, uh, just opportunity that you know these two organizations have um, is probably not as ideal. I mean, you have Digital Take uh, Echidna that's based close to Toronto. Uh, we just felt like this was a little bit more realistic um, in terms of getting other agencies involved and on board. So, I'm talk a little bit about goals. So. Our vision for uh, the 2018 program was a lot different than what we had for 2017, which was really just, what are the goals for this day? What do we want to accomplish? So our goal essentially coming into the 2018 program was uh, how we're going to provide students from either underserved or underrepresented groups uh, with Drupal training, networking, and conference attendance opportunities. Um, it was really important for us to uh, identify goals that were achievable, uh, and we're constantly looking on how to uh, identify new goals, but also uh, things that are really measurable. Um, we wanted to expand the number of students, so this year um, we have uh, 10 students, um, originally had 11, um, and our goal was really to, again, you know, scale this initiative. We didn't want to do something that was just going to be a 2017 Baltimore program. We wanted something that actually would have traction. Um, and actually the partnerships that we established in 2018 were really crucial to our ability to, to be able to do that. Um, we also wanted to expand Palantir's support um, for underserved or underrepresented uh, community members to have access to opportunities within the Drupal community. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we did it. 
Uh, essentially, we uh, implemented a remote program, a remote training program. Uh, we first had uh, a kickoff that was based in Baltimore and connected with the Chicago uh, student cohort virtually. Um, this was done through uh, the teleconferencing uh, system that our other new partner, Fig Leaf, had when training the students in Drupal. So the entire program, with the exception of the kickoff uh, for Baltimore students, of course, uh, DrupalCon and MidCamp, everything else has been remote. So this is very much in line with what Palantir has done, um, just professionally in terms of how we work with each other and clients. And so uh, this was something that was definitely uh, a core goal and I guess a core format of, of how we were teaching and mentoring the students. We decided to use Slack as a communication tool uh, in addition to our weekly lab meetings where we are connecting on the um, I think it's through Microsoft, right? We're it's an Adobe Connect. Adobe Connect. Yeah. Um, and then uh, we were able to schedule both lab and class times where we had both the educational component and then also more ad hoc coaching and training for the students. Um, we have this checkpoint at mid, at mid camp where we have students who are coming in. Um, and then, of course, this program will culminate um, at, at DrupalCon in Nash, Nashville. Of course, we do hope that we can continue uh, the mentorship component beyond that. But that is the scope of what we did this year. So, Adding on to what we talked about before in terms of recruitment, uh, some of the questions that we asked were really about scalability uh, in terms of number of students, in terms of partners, um, what types of skills should people have. Uh, we found that it was really amazing that Genesis Works and Empower both had uh, just existing programming in place so the students had you know basic understanding of a lot of tech concepts so it was relatively easy to add this additional Drupal, um, <laughs> this is something I've been worried about, um, additional Drupal experience um, that wasn't really giving them a crash course in basic computer uh, concepts or, or tech concepts or, or even programming. A lot of the students already had existing experience, so this was something that we found was also really key it, when we were doing a, a capacity assessment. Uh, you know, one of the, the things that we're wondering is also ensuring, how do we ensure continued student participation? Um, you know, how do we uh, not only mentor and coach students throughout this whole process, but, you know, what happens next? Um, as Ryan Price says, is, you know, mentorship is often a lifelong thing. It's a lifelong relationship. It's not just something that you, you do for a summer. So these are some of the questions that we asked ourselves when we were defining this project early on. Strategic partnerships um, are really the backbone of, of, of why we're able to do this. Um, we decided to continue the Empower partnership, but given that, as Allison said, we're based in Chicago, our partnership with Genesis Works was also instrumental in, in allowing us to anchor this program um, in these two, two core regions. Um, I think our partnership with Fig Leaf, uh, who, as I mentioned, um, is actually sponsoring the training uh, because that is their specialty. Uh, Drupalize me um, and then others was just really crucial because we learned at Palantir, like I mentioned, that I don't always have that type of bandwidth to do those activities. And so how are we going to actually address this capacity issue? We wanted to partner with other agencies and get them to donate time and resources so that we could make this uh, more sustainable um, when I am resourced to other projects and have other obligations as well. Yeah, because remember, Palantir is not a training company. You know, I mean, we, we work for clients um, most of the time. So that was a concern, actually, was, well, Palantir wants to train people, but we're not designed to train people. That's not our business model. That's not something we're set up to do. Um, so actually partnering with Figleaf, who was really interested um, in, in this initiative, you know, that's, that's their specialty. That is what they do. Um, and Dave, uh, who's one of the owners of Fig Leaf, who is a veteran and really um, liked the idea of underserved communities, like finding a way to, to help them. We're, we are um, blessed to have him sort of on board because we're hoping that, um, I know it, at least for NPowers uh, groups, they also serve veterans who are looking for work after they come back from various tours. So that's another facet that we could expand into that we're excited about. And then also just allowing other agency uh, professionals to provide mentorship was also key as well. Because many Palantir were already volunteering their time um, in developing and defining the program, and so we definitely needed to have um, 
just a little bit more security in terms of what people are capable of doing in, in a week. Um, something else I want to talk about is just this idea of social capital. You'll see here that there, a lot of it is about who you know and what their skill set is, and what their background is. And I think the reason this is, has been so successful is because we have been able to crowdsource social capital, whether it's through the, these organizations that are uh, you know, well established or through uh, Michael Dickey's connections um, with Fig Leaf, that that really has been instrumental. And that in doing so, we are trying to really just leverage um, the power and, and privilege that we have so that we can actually uh, include, that's what inclusion is essentially, is, is, is taking people by the hand and, and basically introducing them to the people um, who uh, are going to provide them with those opportunities. And by that time, you know, they'll have the skill set. All they're really needing is access. And that is, a, that is the, the core ethos of what we're trying to do here. Uh, so again, implementation. Um, this really was a big question that Allison has already touched upon, who's going to do the training. We do have a colleague who has a history of doing this type of training, but uh, there were some issues around capacity in terms of his involvement. So our partnership with Fig Leaf was really, again, instrumental. I mean, where is this going to be hosted? Where are the students' projects going to live? This was another question that we had to address early on. Um, will these students have access to the internet all the time? Do they have access to laptops and technology? And so that was something else that we had to consider, just basic infrastructure. So we actually Palantir donated refurbished laptops to the students because we wanted to ensure that they actually had this type of equipment um, to be able to complete the course. How are we going to get them to Chicago and Nashville? I'll let Allison speak to this a little <laughs> bit later. Who is going to pay for their travel tickets, accommodations? Where are they going to stay? What is their stay going to look like? Uh, what are the expectations for our interaction with them during these conferences? Um, how are we going to get mentors and what are the expectations? Um, and then who's going to re review and evaluate student work? These are all questions that came up, uh, not just in the beginning, but throughout the project as well. Because again, not everybody's availability is going to be consistent throughout the life cycle of the project. So this is uh, our timeline um, in terms of where we are uh, prior to mid-camp. Um, so the students received uh, their laptops and they were paired with mentors uh, early on in the project, uh, shortly after the kickoff, um, during and shortly after the kickoff. Um, you'll see that we have classes beginning in late January, and then we have those milestones I had mentioned of, of mid-camp and DrupalCon. So here is a photo taken in Chicago uh, during the kickoff. So these students were actually uh, connected to our Baltimore uh, students and instructor. Um, because as I mentioned, uh, Fig Leaf um, was implementing the training and Dave was based in Baltimore. So the Baltimore students had in-person training and then the Chicago students were connecting with us virtually. Here is the, the Baltimore group. Meg Plunkett, who works at Palantir, came down along with Tim, who's on the photo, uh, from Philadelphia to help with the training as well. So yeah, I mean, thanks to the students for being willing on Saturday, January 6th, right after everyone, you know, was coming off of New Year's vacation to do our kickoff. It was a, we spent a full Saturday in the Genesis Works offices, and then, um, where were the offices in, um, was it Mindgrub in Baltimore that donated the office in Baltimore? You were there. I was there. <laughs> I was we went not. to Empower offices. Oh, you went to the Empower offices. It. Okay, yes. yeah. But I think, uh, yeah. I think Mindgrub might have been involved, but yeah. I didn't know that yeah. in the end we were at Empower. Right. So, um, so yeah, we went to their various offices and we held the training remotely. Lauren was there just to answer any specific tech questions. If Dave on the on the um, video was talking too quickly or they missed something, you know, she was there on hand to help with any tech problems. And so here, here's kind of where we are um, now looking forward. Um, just if you're wondering what are the students actually learning, um, they're learning uh, a much more, um, I guess, in-depth in Drupal uh, concepts that will really help prepare for future internships and job acquisition in the Drupal community. So the core goal of the training isn't just to give them exposure as it was on that day of Drupal, but really to build them in core competencies, um, provide them with resume review and other coaching so that they actually can land professional opportunities. That is really the end goal here, is not just a mere exposure, but what inclusion looks like is actually employment and then continued advancement. But, I, but to add to that, like, 
if they don't want to stay in the Drupal community, if they've spent four months with Drupal and they decide this is not my thing, that's fine. You know, <laughs> like, right, right. you know, right. that's Absolutely. yeah. There's no right. there's no obligation. You know, after all this is said and done, that they have to get a job in Drupal. That's that's not what this is for. No, it would be ideal though. <laughs> I'll we call, we I'll, love to assimilate. Yes. I'm like, I'll call you later. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we'll talk offline. Um, so some of the topics that we covered, um, to, we've covered to date are, you know, site goals, analytics, content modeling, content types and fields, um, information architecture or a menu structure, um, blocks, form, social media, and we're just halfway through the program, so we already have another month to go. Um, and students are also working simultaneously on a variety of projects. Um, these are more like passion projects. Uh, so we have students who are building websites for various uh, social organizations of which they're a member. Um, churches, I believe, was one. There's a mariachi band. Um, so in some contexts, we would have you know students uh, actually partner with clients. Um, but in this case, it's more of a passion project. Um, that's just from my personal experience in terms of what students might do. So um, we're really excited to see where their work is in April we've, because we've already, as um, Allison mentioned, had people reviewing their work to date. We had a session actually earlier at MidCamp where Lauren was actually reviewing their code and providing them feedback on what they've done to date. So I'm very excited to see what is next um, when they present their final work at the con. Um, let's talk a little bit about success and some lessons learned. Yes. Sorry, just quickly, and sorry if I spaced on it. Are the mentor matchups to students one to one? Yes. Or, okay. Yeah. So they, um, the way we set it up is that they have class every Friday night, which was actually just the best time when everyone could meet. That was the sort of aggregate time. So there's class hours. Uh, I think it's five thirty uh, Central Time, six thirty uh, Eastern Time where they meet, it is recorded in case they can't make it, they can watch it later, but then there are three lab hours during the week where the mentors and the students can pop in and just work one-on-one -on -one together. And then of course, they also can just do it ad hoc. Everybody's in Slack, we hooked everybody up with Slack together, we created a channel where everyone can talk together. So there's, a, there's ad hoc stuff that goes on that I don't even know about, you know, like, I'm, um, but, um, and, and then some pairings, of course, are busier than others, right? Like there are some pairings that meet absolutely every week at the same time all the time, and then everyone else is a little more here and there. So, any other questions? All right. So, we got some positive feedback in the you know past few weeks about kind of the virtual approach that we took. So. Um, Allison just mentioned that we could actually record the training. So because students are so busy, um, I just like to remind everybody that they're not only generally working, some of them are working and doing internships in addition that are related to their existing organizations, but they also have obligations that their organizations have. So um, students who are connected you know, with um, these existing programs may or may not have other obligations and may be doing that program as well or those program requirements and so um, we want to be mindful of that so I think the flexibility actually really worked out where people who could miss class but could still stay up to speed by actually watching the recordings um, and then if they couldn't necessarily get to lab could always ping or text their mentor and say hey you know I have this question um, so I think that that type of versatility has been really um, just optimal because it allows students to to still be included uh, and still be able to see um, their own project, their own progress and their peers' progress, but not necessarily feeling like, okay, I wasn't in the classroom today, so I've missed all this material. This is a quote from a Baltimore participant who actually is my mentee. So, there's a lot of hard lessons in these types of projects. <laughs> Terrible scrapper. <laughs> so we have had a few speed bumps um, some of these might include web hosting um, that was an issue that I'll let Allison speak to you later um, mentorship um, and those expectations are constantly being negotiated and renegotiated because life goes on and the mentee availability might shift the mentor's availability might shift. Um, even with uh, you know the three lab hours that we have, um, sometimes we only might see a few students actually in you know engaged in lab. 
Um, and so that's also been a question is, so if we don't see them, how do we know how they're doing? How do we know if they have questions? And so understanding when people are not communicating that it doesn't necessarily mean that they don't understand or aren't engaged, but understanding that we need to then figure out, okay, how do we connect with them? How do we check in with them so that they that they um, that we do check for that type of thing? Something else is the two-hour class uh, benchmark once a week. Um, that was really challenging to schedule. Mm -hmm. um, I think another something else that came up was the idea of measuring, which we'll talk about later. Measuring success, measuring milestones, measuring improvement. Um, we don't really have grades. We're not crazy. We don't have <laughs> we don't have midterms. Um, we have we, mid camp. Not we mid have mid camp. So I'll talk about this a little bit later. But how do we how do we identify and measure these milestones? Is is a big question. Um, another thing is we have started with eleven students and now we have ten students. Um, we actually have nine who are actively engaged here at the camp. So another question is, how do we support students so that they can continue this um, type of work? And then what type of reality do we need to actually have in terms of our own expectations? So um, before we dive into measuring success, did you want to talk a little bit more about the some of the some of the logistics exactly. and things? Sure. Exactly. So um, so yeah, I mean between. Like I said, last year we had three weeks to plan and sort of throw something together in um, for a, just a one-day thing at DrupalCon, and, and I thought it went incredibly well considering that it was um, such short notice, you know, and, and we were able to pull it off. So with a year, we, we really did try to anticipate everything. I would say we probably anticipated about 85%, and then there's another 15% that I found myself triaging here and there um, because it's the first time we're doing this, right? So you're not going to get it perfectly the first time. It's, it's very agile in that way. Um, so uh, some of the speed bumps w early on were just, okay, well, how do we get them laptops? What, you know, how do we do that? And thankfully, George, um, at our company, since we did a, a bit of hiring last year, we had refurbished laptops that we could give them. So we, um, then it was a matter of, okay, well, who's going to refurbish them? Who's got the time? So then there was shipping half of them off to Philadelphia and the other half to, to Meg Plunkett and then Lauren on our end helping us in Chicago get those laptops up to speed, getting them to the students. Um, we had to order things like just cables. Okay, we had the laptops, but we didn't necessarily have the right cords anymore. <laughs> you know, Apple changes their technology often enough that, you know, those cords are obsolete. So um, those were some of the logistical things, things like travel, um, just... Um, and then um, the class time, I think, was sort of the biggest Thing that we ended up starting, even though the kickoff was January 6th, we ended up not having class for the first week because we just hadn't gotten our act together in December in order to figure out what days worked best for class. That was just a simple logistical thing that we didn't figure out early enough. So then we had to send out a quick survey to all the students and say, okay, what day works for you actually? Like if we're going to hold a class, what day is actually good? So thankfully they got back to us pretty quickly and we were able to figure it out. But that's just some of the examples of some of the things. Um, I mean, even just yesterday, I was doing a little bit of triage um, with just hosting. Um, but now everyone's up to speed, and um, we're we're all set to go. So, yes, code's been migrated. Everything's been migrated. <laughs> <laughs> everything's everything's working. <laughs> so, I talked a little bit about measuring success, and this is something that's really difficult to do in a pilot program because not only are you implementing, but you're also ideating on how you know what are the KPIs. Right? We do this in our, in our in our redesign project. So, what actually are the things that are happening on the site that the client needs for their business to run, for paychecks to be delivered? And so, we don't have that exact same model, but we do have that big question of you know if we are going to scale this, if this is going to be if this is going to stop being a pilot, you know, what types of benchmarks are folks looking for? What types of milestones do we need to identify and how do we measure it? So some of the questions that we asked were, you know, what do students know at the start of the program? What do we want them to learn and why? Uh, how are we going to measure this type of progress? That's still something that we're working on. What you know, do attendance and participation numbers look like? Should that be a core part of measurement? 
um, or is it really about uh, what their final project looks like and whether or not the final project encapsulates all of those core Drupal concepts that they've learned. Uh, additionally, are students meeting um, curriculum milestones? Again, is that something that we use a project to, to measure or is that something that we use something else to measure? Um, are students completing deliverables? Are students checking in with mentors? Um, how do we adjust the program in the middle of the project and then what does that do to our milestones? And then how do we engage with students after the program? What are our expectations around that? So these are questions that we've formulated and are, we're constantly evaluating how we're gonna demonstrate uh, just not only competence, but then success in the program. And at the end, we'll invite you to share your ideas on this as well. So this is an example of uh, more recently review of Just student work. As in yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> when we say recently, we mean yesterday. <laughs> yes. Um, and getting the environment set up on Pantheon sandboxes yesterday. Yesterday. <laughs> uh, so in terms of what's next, uh, we're going to send uh, what looks like 10 students to DrupalCon Nashville. Um, we really would like students to try to find internships if, if they are interested in pursuing Drupal-related <laughs> careers. Not forcing anybody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to be looking for that final deliverable, which is that personal project, um, which for those of you who just walked in, are sites for a mariachi band, a church, a music act, a recycling blog, a tech help blog, and then more. Um, we, we did try to give them a well-rounded introduction into user experience and strategy, not just Drupal, um, just so that they have some context for um, how Drupal fits into the broader website ecosystem. I feel like we're just building content types to build them. We wanted to make sure that that learning was anchored in, 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 in real goals and in objectives. Um, Can I just jump in real quick? Absolutely. The, the other thing, too, is that, you know, um, we wanted to keep the whole thing flexible, structured enough that we could, you know, show the students, you know, like, here's what's available, right? Here's what's out here. But also um, flexible enough that they could, I didn't have to dictate everything, right? Like, I, you know, even with MidCamp, we, you know, when I sent out last week the email saying, okay, well, here's the general schedule for MidCamp, there, there's much time in them in there for them to pick what sessions they want. You know, look what you're interested in, do what you need to do, you know, see what's out there. And then we'll meet back at this particular time and we'll do these particular things. And that's what I'm going to be trying to do for DrupalCon as well. I mean, um, some of them have been to conferences before, some of them have not. DrupalCon, as many of you know, can be incredibly overwhelming. Like, it's 3,500 people and just, you know, hallways and hallways and hallways of sessions and a lot going on. And um, so we're going to um, meet at particular times, but for the most part, I want them to explore and just choose your own adventure, right? You know, pick, pick what works for you. Um, so we're trying to provide... Um, enough structure so that you know it's a program but also let it be very very self-directed also something that was really successful last year was actually um, introducing the students um, and participants to other agencies who were not necessarily involved in our initiative but might be interested in hiring the students for a potential internship or mentoring the students right. as well. So I think looking at Nashville, we do want to set up those types of connections as well just because they're incredibly valuable. Um, you don't know what you don't know and you know, it's possible that we have folks who are have the exact skill set that someone is looking for. So we want to be able to make make those types of uh, connections. Do you want to speak to you what's next? In terms sure. Of, <laughs> and so um, so I, I'm showing this slide again only because I want to make it very clear that, um, I mean, I know that most of us here in MidCamp are Chicago-based, but we are presenting this again at DrupalCon, and my goal was showing this slide a second time, even though it just magically disappeared, is that um, since we do have these partners that have a lot of... Um, help me, offices, um, yes, locations, chapters. thank you. They have other chapters elsewhere, is that we hope that other Drupal firms will come talk to us and say we'd like to implement something similar, and if they see that they're near one of these locations, they can just sort of dovetail on what we're already doing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, between NPower and Genesis Works, we've got a lot of the U.S. covered, you know, and Toronto. Yes. Um, so I think that would be uh, terrific right. if you can move along. Um, so some of the things that we would definitely recommend are just making sure you identify those strategic partnerships. I, I think it's unfair to assume that Fig Leaf, if, if 50 other Drupal shops wanted to mimic this and do the same thing, Fig Leaf could not possibly handle all of that training, right? So 
finding ways to um, find other ways to train. Um, uh, there, I'm sure there are other shops out there that do something similar. Of course, crowdsourcing all the resource and talent that you, you can, tap into those pre-vetted uh, pools of talent, and then um, incorporating additional programming into the existing framework that we've set up, and then just creating a plan up front, you know, outlining, uh, outlining your costs and needs. So let's, let's do talk about costs because I think um, there are probably going to be some questions around that. So since I am, as I said, in charge of my own sales and marketing budget, um, I put aside $8,000 for um, mostly travel. That's in hard money. I mean, there's unlimited hours that we all spent between just organizing and um, arranging travel and um, of Michelle's time, of Lauren's time, you know, she did the Saturday kickoff, um, things of that nature. But it's been $8,000 in hard costs for just um, travel and hotel and food and venture cards to get them through Chicago. Um, Fig Leaf donated approximately $12,000 in classes. Their, their basic Drupal class is about $1,100 a person. So they donated that to the students. Um, Drupalize Me um, donated six month free subscriptions to every student. We just this morning got, um, so they're not on the chart, PHP Storm just, ta-da, guess what guys? You got PHP Storm subscriptions. Um, <laughs> So, um, and then Acquia and, and again also Pantheon stepped in to help with some hosting. And then the mentors, you know, we had 11 or 12 mentors signed up to help and donate their time just on Slack and on the, um, the lab hours to help the students um, do that, uh, uh, the one-to-one -one help. And then also people who had extra DrupalCon tickets donated their extra tickets to our initiative, and then the mid-camp organizers gave us free tickets for all the students to come here as well. So. Um, it's, it's not free, you know, <laughs> let's just make that clear, but we did, um, we, we really thought that this was important, you know, some of Palantir's values are all about diversity and inclusion and collaboration, and this very much fit into what our value structure is, and so we thought it was important enough, and since I conveniently had money to put aside, um, I made it happen, so. Um, and I will also add that we, we welcome other donations. So if you think of something that you think these students should have, like PHP Storm came to us out of nowhere. Like that, I was literally sitting downstairs an hour ago and Andrea Soper came up to me and said, ta-da, I got you free subscriptions. And I went, what? <laughs> and um, I didn't even know that was a thing. <laughs> so, um, you know, we are, um, I'm, I'm side-eyeing you, Ashley. We are looking for help with hotels in Nashville. Ashley might have a solution for me, so that's why I'm side-eyeing her. Um, <laughs> so... So anyway, if you have any other ideas that we haven't thought of, feel free to, to jump in. Um, so it, as I mentioned on the previous slide, you see that it does take a village. This is a list of all of the people who have been helping out with mentoring, um, all of the people who have been sort of primarily involved in organizing this initiative. Um, Julia Logan is here from Genesis Works. Um, she gave a lightning talk yesterday, if you were there to see it, just giving an overview of Genesis Works and what they're about. Um, and then just some additional support from some organizations. Um, Steve Persh and Dwayne McDaniel stepped in yesterday to help us with some um, uh, hosting needs that we had. And, um, and of course you, if you think of anything you want to do to get involved, please get in touch with us. And that's really it. So. <laughs> if you know any other people, also other, if you look at this list of locations, um, I'll, go, I'll go back really quickly, and you, and you know people who are running Drupal shops in these cities, and you want to be involved, um, but perhaps don't have the bandwidth, but know that they're available, you know, please pass their information our way, please facilitate those connections. Um, I think that also the fact that we have video recordings of all these trainings um, is also not um, unsubstantial because essentially we can use some of the existing material to help coach students um, looking forward at 20, the end of 2018 and then also 20, 2019 as well. Um, so do stay in touch with us. Um, we are going to be at DrupalCon speaking about the same topic, but if you want to learn more or chat with us about this um, or to know more about our students um, and their skill sets, we invite you to reach out. Any questions? Yes? Um, you had mentioned since you had uh, pretty much a whole year to start figuring out the, uh, sort of like the logistics or what you needed to plan for. Once you figured that out, how did you, what was your method for determining what to do first, like the order of, of 
which to work on things to get as much done as you could. Oh my God, so many meetings. Um, <laughs> we met, I think, once a month to start. Starting in late April, we sort of did a retrospective of like, of, okay, what did we do well planning this in three weeks for a day, you know? Um, <laughs> what went well and what, what with more time could we do better? And we just started making sort of a wish list of all the things we wanted to do. Um, really, it didn't, I say that it really didn't start to come together until we identified who our training partner would be, because that was really the biggest logistical challenge we had. Is that that's not Palantir's business model? We don't train people in Drupal, right? Um, and and apparently before my time at Palantir, and I've been there five years, um, it was attempted and it didn't go very well. Um, so uh, that wasn't something we necessarily wanted to go down again, another road we wanted to go down again. So then um, Michael Dickey, as she mentioned earlier, on, a, on the Palantir team hooked us up with Dave at Figleaf, who is set up to do that. Um, and he's got training materials ready to go, and he's got you know lesson plans and video conference. I mean, he had the whole thing planned out. So it was really a matter of, I feel like that's when we hit the ground running, was when we identified that partner to help us with the actual training piece. Because I could, I could, I knew I could do like hotels and logistics and getting people to from point A to point B and getting laptops like that. I knew I had covered, but I didn't know how to actually teach anybody. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so that it sort of would have fallen apart if it hadn't have been for that. Also, there was one situation where uh, actually Dave couldn't come to class because he was sick and Ryan Price who actually works at Palantir was able to step in and so Ryan has been pretty active in all of our classes mm -hmm. just as kind of you backup know, the backup yeah um, and can provide a lot of context during the labs too I um, mean that was another thing I was like I'll mentor but I mean I'm like you'll need your resume looked at you know yeah, so yeah. I think the question is are the people who are available or willing to be available also equipped to give students constructive feedback um, that was another thing because I could sit in on the lab but all I can really do is kind of you know field questions for Ryan and, and, and um and Lauren and so that was another question that came up right yeah How, like what percentage of your, of your time would you say you spend on this project like on a monthly or weekly basis so I'm not billable I don't actually know <laughs> um but I would say for me if I had to average it out probably three hours a week, four hours a week. Obviously some weeks were heavier than others. I mean, just, this week. <laughs> yeah, this week. And, um, but, but, and next week too, because now I'm buying plane tickets for Nashville, right? So I'm gonna be spending a lot of time doing that next week, just looking up flights, making sure um, I can get all that done. Um, and even just typing up the emails to everybody, just making sure, okay, like here's what we're doing, here's the list, you know, that's time consuming stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I'd say for me, it's probably three, four hours a week. I'd say for Ryan, who he does all of the labs, he likes to show up for all the labs um, just to be there if, if anyone has a question. He's probably three hours a week. I don't know, Michelle. Um, it just varies. So yeah, it just kickoff, varies. You know, it was closer to 12 hours, but then mentoring and it ranges from, you know, half an hour to an hour then if Allison yeah. pulls me in it's you know a couple hours this week obviously there's more happening over the weekend but I think it's definitely doable I mean if you want to be a mentor it's definitely not something where it's like you need to spend 10 hours a week on this um, you know it's really about checking in with students being available answering questions and then you move on from there um, so I think your level of involvement also can vary if you're interested yeah I mean but but I think obviously in the beginning when we were organizing it it was a lot heavier you know I mean there was weeks where it was easily two days of my time, you know, especially when we were planning the kickoff and when I was just doing logistics for laptops and things like that, it was a lot more time consuming. So, yeah. And Fig Leaf, I think, probably has one of the more significant time commitments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Can we hear from some of the students maybe about your experience? <laughs> um. Especially Blake, since you were there for the day of Drupal. of Drupal last year, and then you're doing this one, you know. Yeah. Do you want to stand up? Yeah, cool. <laughs> Introduce yourself. <laughs> All right, hey guys. My name is Blake James. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland, uh, from Empower, as you've seen. Um, a little bit about my journey. Um, I started at Empower. Uh, I was always into tech, but I never like, really had an avenue to get from, I'd say, what I knew uh, about uh, 
HTML, CSS, uh, JavaScript, stuff like that. Um, take that to an actual platform that I can actually build upon. Um, Empower kind of shoehorned me into uh, getting serious about it at first. Uh, I just kind of just did things on the side as a hobby. Um, and they showed me a lot of avenues that I can take as far as uh, just the tech community in general. Um, I started um, out, I believe we started um, in January of last year, around May. I got my A plus certification. Um, I'm still working with that as well too. So I have different avenues to go through as far as you know where I want to go. And now I have Drupal as well. So that's something else that I can put in my pocket and say, okay, well, if I want to be a Drupal developer, I can do that. If I want to be a, a help desk technician, I can do that. Um, so it's been a really rewarding uh, opportunity for me. And um, I'm looking forward to whatever else uh, will come out of Drupal and the things that I can learn. So, uh, if anybody has any questions, can you speak about your project? Um, yeah. Um, my project that I'm working on right now. I'm working on a fan site. Uh, it's for a video game that's coming out uh, sometime later next year. It's called Cyberpunk 2077. And right now, uh, I'm just uh, learning exactly what uh, what what actually can be contained in a website or a fan site. In this case, um, this is partially challenging trying to figure out exactly what content I can put in. And on the other side trying to figure out exactly what Drupal is, uh, the components behind it, um, exactly uh, how to work the different modules um, and distributions. And um, I'm learning plenty right now. <laughs> <laughs> Natasha or Vanessa, you wanna? Yes. Yes, me. I'm sorry, I got, uh, sorry. <laughs> Um, so my name is Yasmin Reyes. Um, I am currently a first year computer science major um, here in Chicago. Um, and I'm also part of Genesis Works and an alum. Um, so when I got started with Genesis Works, um, they, they you know, um, attract um, high school students um, in becoming more prepared for internships, as Julia spoke about yesterday in a lightning talk. Um, so Julia was able to speak to me about uh, Drupal and like uh, Palantir and like joining together um, and doing this like seemingly really cool and uh, rigorous kind of um, learning of uh, this new entire system that I've never heard of before. Um, so for me, because I am going to school still, I think it was like very important to me that it was flexible, which is something that they highlighted on, like recorded classes and uh, lab hours that vary from day to day. Uh, was important for me because, uh, like I said, I was going to school, I have a job, so it's like, you know, have, making sure that I can balance that all out um, was very important that they were a key role in building that flexibility for me. Um, so my personal project, I am also, besides uh, what I just stated, I'm a mentor in a mariachi organization here based in Chicago. Um, and so um, I really wanted to show them, like, an idea of what they could, how they could um, promote themselves. Um, and attract more um, students from ranging from the elementary to the high school uh, level of music musicianship, um, which is just something that I'm working on. Before. Hello, my name is Vanessa Puerta, and I'm also an alum at Genesis Works. Um, I went for a year in UIC, and then from there I went to another year at Europe, which is similar to Genesis Works. However, I am going more towards um, cybersecurity and, and the aspect, and as well in Drupal, I'm looking more into, if I do end up going more in that in Drupal, looking more into like the bug area, that would go more towards my specific, um, uh, what I'm thinking about um, majoring as an undergrad. Um, so throughout this whole program, I'm also working at United for an internship, um, specifically in their information security team, so it's sort of, um, I like the flexibility as well as I am able to, um, you know, be at work and then try to get there on time for um, the classes or lab hours, or if I don't get there for the classes, I'm able to um, go into the recordings. So I'm just still trying to figure out a way um, to be able to maneuver through the, the um, 
my skills that I already have in security, as well as implement them towards Drupal and the community. Um, and I'm working on a church on site. Um, my church doesn't have an actual website, so I'm also going to be promoting um, the website um, and to them to see like if they're, they're actually giving me feedback right now as to like what it is um, that they're sort of looking into. I still haven't told them that I'm actually building it, but I'm just saying like, mm -hmm. if you would like a website, what would be your consideration? It's yeah. so, <laughs> very um, smart, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so depending on the outcome, then I'll show it to them mm -hmm. to see how far I got into it. So that's what I'm working at right now. I, um, Ryan actually um, redirected me to a group that they have um, for a church and the community. However, the last post was in like 2015, so it's not really helpful right now, so I'm still trying to look into more like um, the community and their involvement in church websites, and mostly for Jubal 8. She's also doing her, her website in both Spanish and English. Yeah. We should hook you up with Lingotech then. <laughs> the multilingual action. Thank you. Thank you. I'm hoping Yasmin can tell me more about mariachi. <laughs> Any questions for the participants? Questions for us? Okay. We have business cards up here, so if you want to grab one to connect with us later, uh, feel free to come up here and we can connect now or yeah. later. Not a question, just a comment. Sure. You're just awesome to have this great idea and move <laughs> forward with it. Even like last year when you're saying we have three weeks, what can we accomplish? Yeah. I mean, we can all sit here and say, oh, it would be great to do something, and you actually did it. Well, thank you. Thank you. And, um, you know, it's funny. I mean, I feel like most people, you know, in, in just in general, want to do things, right? They want to help. They want to do things. I mean, I, I wish I had more time to do all sorts of volunteering things. You know, I'm a single mom of two boys, so that just doesn't happen. Like, I, there are just a lot of things I'd love to get more involved in, and I can't. So it was, um, it was interesting because, you know, I'm in this very fortunate position where I'm, I'm not billable and I have my own budget, you know? <laughs> And, um, and, and I'm also really tenacious, much to the chagrin of my bosses. So um, I... Uh, we love it. I'm well, not your boss. I love it. I love it. Allison's like, I think I have this idea. And then... And know, then George goes, oh, God, what is it? <laughs> and then, um, but yeah, so I, um, I was getting a little frustrated, to be honest, um, that I, as Michelle mentioned earlier, there was just a lot, a lot of talk, like, how do we fix this? There's, you know, there's not enough diversity in Drupal. And I, here I was, and I just thought, this is so easy. You know, I've got three weeks. Can I find some students to go to DrupalCon? Like, can't we do something? Like, it just seemed like such an easy thing. And it wasn't, of course, but it, it's, in theory, it, it seemed easy. And so, thankfully, it just, it, like I said, it was very serendipitous that Michelle had the time, and she was based in Baltimore to, to really do some initial digging and to help me make it happen. So I also did youth education for yes. four years before I came to Palantir. So for me, I had heard a lot of conversations about diversity. I did a lot of diversity committees. I was kind of tired of talking about diversity, to be honest. And as a person of color, I think, for me, it just was a matter of you know, time, yeah. budget, resources, and you know, when is this gonna happen? Um, and what can, I, what can I do and what can I do? And I think essentially I was thinking based on all of this conversation around diversity in, in Drupal, I really was like, let's just, let's just implement something. Yeah. And you know, it's like our clients, let's give them something to react to, right? Yeah, so yeah. That, let's <laughs> give them an idea for people to um, you know, build upon. And that was something that was really crucial. Yeah, and I, and I don't think we did everything right. You know, like I said, I mean, um, uh, you know, I'm I'm doing my best, you know, but I I think we did pretty well. Most okay. valuable player and also MVP <laughs> product. <laughs> Ashley. <laughs> so I'm really sorry if you did cover this in the first like, 10 minutes that I missed, but I'm just curious, are you doing this, you said it was a four month program, is it gonna be an annual thing where, like every year you intend for it to kind of follow that same schedule and every year you kick off with a new group in January or as are you intending to kind of grow it and maybe just it's always it's an ongoing like essentially you would have three different programs in a year right if it were to grow and um I I don't think we'd have the capacity to do three in a year um I think it would have to be just this like mm -hmm. you know maybe December to through April you know leading up to DrupalCon um I I don't think any of us have the bandwidth to be able to do this three times or four times in a year um, 
as for would we do it exactly the same way next year, I think we got it 85% of the way there. So I think we do, yeah, I think we do it again next year. Um, I think it's to be determined if it's the same students or if it's a new pool of students. Um, my secret, um, you know, very diabolical wish is that one of them would like to intern for us, you know? <laughs> so um, that's just throwing that out there. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, again, it's it's really my hope is after DrupalCon we're we're also going to do some career support right like we've get, we've got our HR department who's willing to help them with their resumes they've already got resumes already I mean they're they're there and I'm gonna ask them to bring them to DrupalCon hint hint so that when you're meeting people they have them at the ready mm -hmm. um, but we we want to help them with that support to to help find work if they want to stay in Drupal you know maybe again maybe they come out of four months and say yeah it's not my thing you know. And that's fine, but they've got another set of skills that they can speak to and draw upon. Um, so yes, we'd like to repeat it again next year. It'll probably be similar. I don't know if it'll be exact. It's to be determined. I'd like to see more um, engagement from other chapters. So it would be great if some of these other chapters within NPower and Genesis Works um, that also are by other Drupal shops could actually um, begin to mentor people locally. That would be fantastic because, because that would help with our capacity as well. Right, and I do, and I do think if you look at sort of the way we're doing it from December through April, you know, you've got Midcamp very nicely sort of tucked two thirds of the way there. And I believe there's a Drupal camp somewhere in Southern California around roughly the same time as Midcamp, um, if I'm if, if I'm remembering correctly. So I mean, it would be great if we could sort of write this playbook and say, okay, well here's the playbook on how to do this. Mm -hmm. Give it to another Drupal shop who can implement something similar. Mm -hmm. And maybe they don't have the budget to be able to do as many students as we're doing. Maybe it's only four, right? Maybe it's two, whatever. But if we can create it in such a way that other Drupal shops can copy us, mm -hmm. I mean, think of, of how many more students we could, you know, bring in. Oh, sorry, now I have another question. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> have, can this work in an entirely remote setting? Like, or is it really necessary for the mentors and mentees to have face-to-face -face time? I, I, so far, I don't think any of them have met face to face. I have because yeah. I was in Baltimore and I met my mentee at the kickoff, but I have not met with her since. Okay, just uh, when yeah. you were describing the classes, I was assuming I was thinking traditional mm -hmm. like classrooms. Yes. No, no, no. It's all virtual, and um, I mean, my hope is that, of course, at DrupalCon, most people go right. So I think there will be sort of like this big happy reunion right. of mentors and mentees mm -hmm. that can finally meet face to face. But so far, I don't think, with mm -hmm. the exception of Michelle, that. Right any of them have met their mentors. And then also, didn't um, Chris Rooney host some students? He did, but here. the mentor was out of town but that day. Was yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so yeah. the ment I feel like there's mentorship happening and there's face-to-face -face with people, but they're not necessarily that one-to-one. -one. Yeah. But also, I think something I'd be interested in is getting the students involved in speaking at Drupal camps as well, um, now that they've actually um, you know, mastered some of these components to actually practice speaking about Drupal concepts. So we have Drupal Gov, I haven't mentioned this to the Baltimore crew at all, Surprise. but we do have Drupal um, GovCon coming up, and so it'd be great to see some submissions um, for that as well, um, since it's so close by. So give, getting them exposure through public speaking also is something I think that would be really valuable as well. Yeah. So the in-person commitment as far as a Drupal shop in another city getting on this model is the a space for a weekly class and someone to be there is sort of the backup like so we're sort of like I mean if it's just another four people would they be able to be added on remote the way Chicago is or would we try to have to figure out the you know the, the yeah replacing the very critical role that they leave. Right, yeah, so so there was, so Dave did get sick one week and he unfortunately slept through class because <laughs> he was so ill he couldn't even like get up to tell us he wasn't gonna make class that day. And luckily the, um, uh, Ryan. Ryan was there and was able to step in but, but more specifically that meeting um, invite was not only to Dave's, you know, he wasn't the only one who could um, start the meeting. So we had access, thank you. I'm like trying to, yeah. So, and, and I, and I deliberately set up the lab hours the same way too, so that I didn't need to be the moderator, right, of any meeting. Anybody could moderate, you know, so it was just little logistics like that, making sure that everybody had access to the meeting time so that the meetings could happen no matter what happened. And the students were only together as far as my, I understand unless of course you've taken some of the labs or classes 
you know, together, that students are signing on on their own laptops from various locations. So some people they get off work and they hop on to class. They're like, you know, running home and they and they hop on a lab. So with the exception of the kickoff, mid camp, and DrupalCon, everything else is done remote. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. And there was one class, I think it was last week, because of the blizzard that went through Baltimore, yeah. only one person showed up because the others lost power. Yeah. You know, I mean, that happens, right? So it was recorded. They watched it later. You know. <laughs> so. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Only person.